Good evening, everyone. I'm Emmanuel Melisaris. I'm an associate professor here at LSE uh, Law, specializing in legal philosophy and uh, uh, criminal law. Uh, a very warm uh, welcome to, to all of you uh, to this LSE Law event, uh, public discussion of the popular uh, mandate. Now, there is uh, an assumption every time uh, the people express themselves through elections, uh, uh, generally, that uh, they do so in a coherent way, that you know, the multitude of opinions, of views that are available in the political community uh, are somehow merged in one voice, one uh, message or, or mandate. Uh, but what exactly the mandate is is far from, from uh, clear. I mean, you know, some might think that there might be some second order principles uh, that set certain constraints that uh, you know, the people cannot authorize, uh, to quote a famous example, they cannot authorize the, the killing of blue-eyed uh, babies at birth. Uh, but even if uh, we suppose that this is right, uh, it still leaves a very large area of, uh, of ambiguity. And the disagreement uh, about the content of the, of the uh, popular will has intensified perhaps more than ever since the June uh, EU referendum. Uh, which uh, uh, might not monopolize our discussion uh, uh, tonight, but uh, it probably um, will. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the uh, trivial analytic truth uh, is that Brexit means Brexit. But what does Brexit mean? Uh, if you, if you, uh, uh, if you're so uh, uh, you're that way inclined, and uh, look at the hands of minutes of parliamentary debates, especially on the 12th of October, uh, when uh, the House debated um, the uh, negotiations, the, term of, um, uh, the terms of the Brexit, you'll see that the disagreement is, is very wide and, and uh, very uh, deep. So uh, all uh, sorts of questions uh, are opened up. Uh, can the popular mandate be measured uh, in, uh, in any uh, accurate way? Is it legally uh, binding? Uh, in, uh, in the case of general elections, uh, what happens when a party departs from, uh, from their manifesto? What consequences might, uh, might that have? What is the role of democratic procedure in specifying and determining the will of uh, the people? So our distinguished uh, guests, uh, to whom I'm, I'm very grateful for joining the panel uh, tonight, will approach uh, that question from a number of uh, uh, angles, uh, from uh, uh, a political scientific angle, a political philosophical one, a legal one, and of course from uh, uh, the perspective of active uh, politics. So let me introduce our uh, uh, speakers in the order in which they will speak. Uh, Catherine Flickshu is Professor of Political Theory uh, here at the LSE in the Department of uh, Government. Uh, she's the author of uh, Kant and Modern Political Philosophy, but it's also published very widely on a number of other topics, such as global justice, uh, human rights, and, uh, and more. Uh, she has also just completed another, uh, another book, uh, but uh, the title is not uh, official yet, so I'm not going to give it to you. Uh, you'll, you'll have to wait. Uh, John Curtis, on my right, is Professor of Politics at the University of Strathclyde, a leading political uh, scientist and polling expert. He's also a senior research fe fellow at Natsen for social uh, research and the chief commentator on What UK Thinks, which, uh, is, uh, which provides non-partisan information on UK attitudes uh, to the European Union before and after the referendum. Shona Douglas Scott holds the anniversary chair in law at Queen Mary University of uh, London at uh, the School of Law and is also co-director co of the Center for Learned Society in a Global Context. She works in the fields, uh, in a number of fields, uh, uh, which include constitutional law, EU public law, legal and social theory, and uh, human rights. She's the author and editor of uh, uh, a number of uh, books, uh, and of course very many articles, and those include EU human rights law, which I think is forthcoming. It is. Uh, constitutional law of the European Union, and law after modernity. Uh, uh, Shona uh, has been a, a prolific commentator on the constitutional aspects of uh, Brexit, and she was recently appointed as an advisor to the Scottish Parliament uh, European and External Relations uh, Committee. Her work will uh, focus on the EU referendum, uh, what else, and its implications for Scotland. Uh, Dominic Grieve, MP, 
has been an MP for Beaconsfield since 1997. He was the Shadow Attorney General from 2003 to 2009, Shadow Home Secretary from 2008 to 2009, and Shadow Justice Secretary from 2009 to 2010. After the general election uh, of 2010, he was appointed a Privy Councillor and Attorney General, uh, an office which he held until July 2014. He's currently a member of the Standards and Privileges Committee of the House of Commons, and in September 2015, he was elected Chairman of the Intelligence and Security uh, Committee. Now, before I invite our first speaker, just a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping uh, details. Uh, first of all, the event will be uh, recorded, and so will your questions uh, at the end. Um, if you want to ask a question uh, over Twitter, uh, please feel free to do so by using the hashtag uh, LSE mandate, uh, which I think, uh, I know sounds like a bit of a double entendre, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, don't be too embarrassed to use it. <laughs> um, and um, uh, either, either I or my colleague Bradley Barlow, who will be in the audience, will, uh, will pick up your, uh, your mandate and uh, communicate it to the, uh, to the speakers. Uh, so each speaker will uh, uh, speak for about uh, 15 minutes or, or so, and then uh, we should have enough time for uh, some questions and uh, answers. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I'll invite our first uh, speaker, Katrin Flickschul. Thanks very much, Emmanuel, and thanks very much um, to everyone for coming and joining us at this event. Um, so, the first thing I should say is this is not my area. Um, I, don't, I don't really work in, in this area. And the second thing that I want to say is um, that I therefore don't know how much I can say that is of any use to this um, whatsoever. But I think that that is probably a um, kind of thing that most people who work in political theory, political philosophy, will say in relation to something like this, because obviously political theory is a fairly abstract uh, discipline and doesn't really engage with the day-to-day -day of politics. So um, I think the remarks that I will make, come. Um, uh, I have thought about this topic directly in relation to Brexit. I've, I've, I've since been told that wasn't necessary, but my, my well, comments will fine. actually um, directly refer to Brexit. But um, they're not really sort of policy related or anything like that. Um, and looking at the question, so I, I, will, I think I will make basically three points which are um, more or less uh, directly related. They are conceptually related, I would say, and they relate to the, to the terms, to the words in the, in the question. When the people speak, what do they say? And when I read that um, question, the first, the first thing that occurs to me is that I'm not really quite sure that I understand what the question means. Um, because intuitively, I sort of think, when the people speak, what do they say, I sort of think, well, they say what they say. When somebody speaks, they say something. Um, and whatever it is that they say is what they say. So I was wondering whether actually what is being meant here is when the people speak, do, what do they mean? Th that makes more sense to me. Because that, that suggests that um, uh, the people might be speaking, but they may not mean what they say. And I think that um, in the context of Brexit, um, especially perhaps in the context of post-Brexit, the immediate uh, post-Brexit uh, sort of situation. Um, uh, my sense is that that question might actually apply quite well to that, because I, I remember everyone waking up the day after and, um, and saying, we're out, uh, like in a state of shock, like this was never meant to happen. Um, but there it is, it had happened. And I think that on TV, um, subsequently, uh, uh, when people were interviewed, a number of them basically said, I voted no, but I never thought uh, that we'd actually be out. Um, so, so there is a sense uh, uh, in relationship to the, to the Brexit referendum that one gets that um, not everyone necessarily meant what they said. So not, not everyone necessarily meant no when they said no. Um, and that is quite interesting. So it raises then this question about, well, if you didn't mean what you said, then why did you say it? And then, of course, um, uh, uh, the answer often is, well, I said it in anger, or I said it in frustration, or I said it because I could. So people might say stuff that they don't mean um, because they're angry with something, or because they don't really uh, know what they want, um, uh, so they say one thing rather than another, but 
only once having said it, they realize, actually, that's not what I meant. I meant, I meant something else. Um, or they might just um, uh, give two fingers to, to someone whom they can't um, communicate with in, 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 in another way. And of course, post-Brexit, there was quite a lot of talk about how um, uh, a lot of the no vote was a vote against the political establishment, as much or even more so than a vote against the EU. So in that sense, one might, ask, might, one might answer this question, when the people speak, what do they mean in the Brexit context? Well, they might have said one thing, but they might have meant another thing, or they might not have known what they meant. Yeah? Um, and then I asked myself, well, why, why would this have been a context in which this applies, i.e., when the people speak, they don't mean what they say? And I've mentioned one thing already, i.e., um, uh, a sense of frustration or a sense of anger. Um, but, of course, another way in which one might end up saying what one doesn't mean uh, is when one uh, doesn't know what one means. So one doesn't know um, uh, whether one should say yes or no. Uh, so it's possible that a lot of people actually didn't mean what they said because they were actually very uninformed uh, when they voted. And again, it's often been said in the post-Brexit analysis that uh, the debate was very poor on both sides. Yeah, the debate leading up to Brexit was actually very emotive. Um, there was uh, a lot of uh, accusations on either side. The press was uh, quite sort of um, uh, uh, heavily involved, um, uh, uh, but not as, an, as, as, a, as a judicious informer uh, of the public, uh, but rather emotionally involved. So in that sense, one might say, in, in the Brexit um, context, it was hard for the people um, to mean what they said, what they said, because it was difficult for the, for the people to actually understand what they were saying. And the reason why it was difficult is because the public debate was so, was so impoverished, really. So people actually, in the end, uh, perhaps voted with their emotions more than um, uh, from feeling. And the question that then arises from a political theory perspective, one of the questions that arises, does it matter? Does it matter in a referendum context whether you said, um, whether you meant what you said? Does it even matter whether you knew what you were saying? Yeah? So in a referendum context, you're asked the big question and you can say either yes or no. And so you say either yes or no, and that produces a result. Does it matter whether you knew what you were saying or not? Well, in one sense, of course, it matters a lot. <laughs> um, in a substantive sense, it matters a lot if you said no or yes and actually meant the opposite. Because, of course, you saying no or yes and meaning the opposite will help determine the actual outcome, and that will affect you in one way or another. So in a substantive sense, in terms of where that leaves you materially, if you like, or in terms of actual policies that follow, it matters um, in some sense whether you know what you were saying or not. I say in some sense because, of course, you're just one of the people who didn't know what they were saying when they said what they, what they said. Um, so it just matters... It, it has an incremental effect. So, but in one sense, one might say it matters because uh, the outcome is one that will materially affect, affect you. So if you didn't mean what you said, then uh, you might have worsened your situation one way or the other. But in another sense, it doesn't really matter. And uh, that's the more procedural sense. In the procedural sense, it doesn't really matter whether you knew what you were saying. Um, all that matters is that there be an outcome that can be considered fair um, in the procedural sense, i.e. you had the chance to vote, you voted, this produced an outcome, and that is actually what was wanted. What was wanted was a fair outcome and not the right answer. So in that sense, it doesn't really matter whether you, um, uh, uh, whether you knew what you were saying or whether you didn't. Procedurally, it produced an outcome, whether you knew it or not. Yeah? Um, it produced a determinate outcome, uh, which is taken up. And I think that point, that last point, is often one that um, uh, is sort of forgotten about. The, the importance of the procedural point, uh, point can be forgotten about, especially when the outcome is then one where a lot of people feel regret over. And remember, after the, after the uh, vote, there were calls for a second referendum. That was quite interesting, because people obviously thought, oh no, the, the outcome was wrong. Um, let's do it again. 
and get it right this time. And those who had voted no and meant no obviously didn't want a second referendum, and they were worried that if there was a second referendum, then um, perhaps it would go against them this time. But from a procedural perspective, um, the reason why you shouldn't really ask for a second um, referendum is precisely that from a procedural perspective, whatever the outcome is, it ought to be uh, accepted as the outcome. So procedurally, it would actually be quite wrong um, to say, well, the people didn't know what they meant. Um, now they know what they meant, so let's do it again. So I would say, substantively, it matters whether you know what, whether you, know what you mean or mean what you say, but procedurally, arguably, it doesn't. And arguably, the Brexit vote was, in a sense, more of a procedural matter, i.e., a decision had to be taken, it was taken. Whether people knew the decision <laughs> was right or wrong, in some sense, doesn't matter. So that was the first point I wanted to make. Just, and and I, I don't want to, so here you probably now can see. Does this help me? Well, probably not really. Um, but it's just a sort of set of reflections at a more abstract level about what happens in a referendum. And, and um, this whole issue about need you mean what you say politically? Well, in, in one sense, yes, but in another sense, arguably not. And there's a second question that I wanted to raise, and perhaps that's actually much more um, tangible in a way. Um, is, so when the people speak, what do they say or what do they mean? Well, then the question is, well, who are the people? And that is, of course, a big question in political theory. Who are the people? Um, how is a people constituted? And that is quite important in the voting context because, of course, we assume that when people vote, then the voice of the people is heard. But, of course, when people vote, then the voices of many people are heard. But how does the voices of many people sum up to the voice of the people? And this is a hard question in political theory, i.e., how do we turn a multitude into a unity? Um, so in everyday politics, we might easily just refer to the people saying this uh, on the, and, and, and the people doing that. But uh, as a matter of sort of political theory, it begs the question as to who the people are. And in the voting context, this is quite important because depending on your view of how the people is constituted and how you as the individual relates to that whole, um, you will think about voting differently. And I just want to very, very briefly mention two names to you, two names from the history of political thought. One is John Locke. He's a 17th century, I always get these 17th century um, uh, English political um, theorist. Isn't that right, 17th century? <coughs> yes. And the other one is um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, <coughs> who is an 18th century um, political theorist, but from Switzerland, French Switzerland. And they gave quite different answers to who the, who the people are on how, or how the people is constituted. I think of Locke, one can say that he thought much more in terms of the people as an aggregate of individuals. So the people, the, the people are actually many individuals who happen to live together. Um, and each of these individuals has their own will. Um, and so if you want to make a decision that affects the entire people, then you ask each of these individuals what their view is. So you ask a vote of each of them, and what you're basically asking is what their particular private view on the matter is. And then you sum these individual views, you basically see where the majority lies, and then you decide the majority voice is the voice of the people. But that is based on counting individual views on this issue. And Rousseau thought that this was totally not how you know um, uh, what the people think. This is at best how you know what every individual thinks privately, but it doesn't get you the voice of the people. So Rousseau had this very complicated concept of the um, general united will, but basically what he wanted is that um, when individuals vote, what they should ask themselves is not what do I think or what do I want, they should ask themselves what is in the public interest. So they should distinguish between their own preference and what they judge to be in the public interest. And they should vote in accordance with that. So for Rousseau, the surest sign of you voting correctly, i.e. the surest sign of you voting in the public interest, was when you 
voted against your private interest. That, that was a sign that you were probably voting in the public interest. So in relation to Brexit, again, I think we heard a lot about how um, uh, 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 everyone wanted what was good for Britain. <coughs> the yes people wanted what was good for Britain and the no people wanted what was good for Britain. But there wasn't, as I said, there wasn't exactly a very um, dispassionate debate over what it even means for something to be good for Britain. And so I suspect that most people actually went the Lockean way, and perhaps the Lockean way is actually, empirically, the realistic way. So most people, I suspect, um, voted with what they wanted and probably assumed that what they wanted was also what Britain wanted. Yeah? So I suspect that most likely the distinction between your private interest and what you take to be in the public interest um, was not made, and I suggest that the, the debate around Brexit certainly didn't encourage reflection on, on that distinction. So it's quite likely that the people didn't speak. It's more likely that in the case of Brexit, many individuals spoke. And it's quite possible that that is all you can get. Yeah? It's not, I'm not saying that R Rousseau gives you um, a good or a plausible theory of, the, of what it is to speak with one voice for what it is for the for united people to speak with one voice but it is nonetheless important i think to remember this distinction between voting on the basis of your private preference or voting on the basis of what you take to be in the public interest and here arguably little chance was given for really a dispassionate discussion about what the public interest is so it's not clear to me that there was a people who spoke it looks to me more that probably many individuals spoke but I'm also saying it's not clear to me that one can really, in practice, get more than many individuals speaking. So again, I'm not sure how helpful any of what I'm saying is. I just want to conclude with a third point. And this is, um, this is something to do with, I mean, I just mentioned to you two, um, two views of who the people are, or how the people is constituted, or how politically we determine the will of the people, either majori majority decision, and this is effectively, of course, what, um, what most um, real uh, um, uh, democratic systems adopt, or this idea of public deliberation in the public interest and, you and reaching um, really a unanimous decision. That would be the Rousseauian idea, yeah? that, the, that it's a convergence of individual wills rather than the majority decides how the, how the rest is carried. Now, I think that in Britain after Brexit, there was also talk of a constitutional crisis in the sense that the referendum was advisory but not decisive. Um, and there was talk about, uh, uh, in Britain, the British system being a parliamentary democracy, i.e. Um, it's really the MPs who are the voice of the people because they represent sections of the people. So there was quite a lot of talk about a constitutional crisis because parliamentary democracy had, as it were, been bypassed as a result of the, of the referendum. But I sort of wonder whether the crisis was in some sense deeper. Um, I sort of wonder whether in some sense there was a Lockean revolution of thoughts going on because Locke again thinks that the government is, um, is held in trust. So for, for Locke, um, the people appoint a government whom they entrust with the power to govern them. But when the government fails any longer to be responsive to the people, there can be situations when the people decide, as it were, to take power back from the government. So in that case, you have a revolution, but a very kind of a very kind of orderly revolution, I think, for the lock-in, because you wouldn't overthrow the state, you would simply remove the government in order to set up a new government. And so from this perspective, it might be that there wasn't so much a parliamentary, cri uh, a constitutional crisis in the sense that parliamentary democracy was bypassed. There might have been, in some sense, more of a constitutional crisis in the sense that people felt that parliamentary democracy had to be bypassed. And this connects up with this thought that a lot of people felt the political establishment is just doing what they're doing. They have no sense of what the people want. Uh, London is completely disconnected from the people. So in that sense, the referendum was an opportunity for people to vote against 
um, against the parliament in a certain sense. And that would have been something of a Lockean um, vote of no confidence in uh, the government that is entrusted with them. So, uh, so those are my very abstract thoughts to, uh, to the question of uh, when a people speak, um, what do they say? First of all, I'm not sure that there was a people. I'm not sure that there ever is a people. And secondly, um, the other thing that interested me, um, is it necessary for them to mean what they say or even to know what they mean? Um, or is it quite enough that they say something and produce an outcome by that? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to avoid the temptation to talk about Brexit for the next 15 minutes, to be honest. Um, I want to focus on what I took to take to be the central concept um, behind this discussion, which is the idea of the mandate. Um, and to think about the extent to which the mandate exists, what are its implications, and I guess towards the end to think a little bit about whether or not it's a good idea. I'm going to do this in uh, the kind of three parts to this. I'm going to suggest that so far as elections are concerned, there are two kinds of mandates that are often talked about. One is a personal mandate and the other is a policy mandate. And I'm only then towards the end going to look at the third aspect, which is the nature of the mandate that may be provided by a referendum. What all of these, of course, all have in common is the idea at the end of the day is that authority and legitimacy in a democracy does indeed lie in the ballot box. And in a sense, what we're then trying to discuss is what is the nature of that authority and the extent of that legitimacy that the ballot box actually conveys. And I'm essentially going to suggest this in part depends on your understanding indeed on what people mean what people mean when they say something in the ballot box but also also depends actually on the institutional structure within which the ballot box is embedded okay let me just take some of these ideas forward so as i suggested there are really two ideas of mandates that are often talked about in a democracy one is the idea of the personal mandate that is that those who have won and by implication only those who have won in the ballot box have the right to hold office and therefore to exercise the power that's associated with that office. The other idea is the policy mandate. And you often hear politicians talk about this. We, on the election, we have a mandate to do X and X is whatever happens to be in the manifest, that party's manifesto that that particular politician thinks is a rather good idea. But the broader idea, therefore, is that a party or a government via an election has the right to implement the policies that it promised in advance of that election without undue let or hindrance. And there are some ways in which this is procedurally expressed. It's expressed through the idea of the Salisbury Convention, whereby the House of Lords does not usually, in the end, block something that was in the elected government's or the current government's manifesto. It was also de facto applied in the case of the Scottish Independence Referendum of 2014 because the UK government accepted that uh, because it was in the manifesto of the SNP in 2011 to hold a referendum on independence and they had won a majority in the Scottish Parliament, they therefore had a mandate to hold that referendum, albeit the UK government didn't think they had the legal authority to do so. So there are quite clear instances where political institutions and decisions are being shaped by this idea um, of the policy, policy mandate given through the ballot box. Now, as already supplied, there are potential quid pro quos that go with these ideas. The first is that if you haven't won an election, you don't have the right to hold the office um, uh, that is reliant um, upon that election. And that, of course, is certainly sometimes thought to apply to those who become prime minister as a result of something other than winning a general election. It can also certainly be and quite often used to question the idea that, which we certainly had a discussion about during the negotiations <coughs> about a coalition in 2010 as to whether um, or not any party other than the largest party in the House of Commons could actually provide the core 
of a government. In other words, is it right to keep out of government the party that has most seats um, in the House of Commons? And equally, it's certainly the idea can also be used to question whether, in fact, smaller parties should have significant involvement in the coalition because, hey, they didn't win the election. So the idea of the, of the personal mandate through the ballot box is certainly used to uh, lay claims to legitimacy, both of, of, of prime ministers and also of certain forms of government. Equally, of course, another potential quid pro quo is that if a party doesn't implement something that it promised in its manifesto, if indeed it had a mandate to do so, then presumably voters have the right to punish it for having failed um, uh, to implement. So in other words, the idea of the mandate can also become, in effect, a criterion by which voters decide to judge what politicians have done. Um, another uh, implication is that a party that decides to pursue a policy that it didn't put in its manifesto is perhaps one where the Commons and indeed the Lords has a rather greater right to challenge and question and perhaps block than is one that actually appeared um, in that manifesto. Okay, so those are the ideas I'm talking about. So they, they, they have, in a sense, they are ideas that give authority and rights, or they are either give to or at least they are claimed by politicians. But in making those claims, politicians also potentially lay, uh, put forward the possibility of limitations on the extent to which that right actually uh, should go. Now, how valid, quote-unquote, are these ideas, um, particularly within the UK context? Well, let me say, first of all, I think in, the, in, the, in a parliamentary system in which, at the end of the day, the aim of an election is not to elect a government, but to elect a parliament, whose job it is then to hold a government accountable, and who, uh, where the government's, the, the legitimacy of government ultimately relies on its ability to maintain the confidence of the House of Commons, these arguments about whether or not a new prime minister should go out and get a mandate because they don't have one, because they've not got an election, is frankly relatively dubious. And it's amazing how every time it happens, the issue gets raised without realizing that actually if you tot up the ways in which post-war UK prime ministers have become prime minister, there are just as many who became prime minister in the first instance as the result of succeeding a prime minister who resigned as actually became prime minister the first time around as the result of election. So actually, uh, in the UK system, it's perfectly clear that people quite often are just as likely to become prime minister as a result of resignation, as we have recently seen, as they are as the result of election. If you want to have personal mandates of that kind, you need something like the mayor of London, US presidential elections. There you have clearly the idea that the office of the executive head of government is indeed something that's reliant directly on the message of the ballot box uh, rather than indirect mechanisms such as parliaments. Now, that said, of course, we can also ask the question, well, actually, to what extent do voters in elections vote for leaders as opposed to parties? Well, let me give you a very quick summary of what I think the political science literature says. It says, yes, actually, to a degree, my lord, yes, it's true. Some voters are, to some degree, perhaps inclined to vote for what they, whether or not they like or dislike a leader, as opposed to what they think of their party. But certainly they do so to a much less extent in a parliamentary system than they do in a presidential one. And of course, the reason why it's very, very difficult to disentangle is that actually people's views about political parties are very often shaped through the leaders because the leaders are the principal spokespersons and the principal person who communicates the message of that party in any one point in time. So therefore, in truth, it's very, very difficult to define or to ascertain a personal mandate as opposed to a party one. What about the policy mandate, which is perhaps in some senses the more interesting um, idea? Now, the truth is, once we get into this area, we're getting into probably what I suppose is the biggest normative question that political scientists like myself asked about the electoral process. 
to what extent do voters actually vote on the basis at all of what politicians say in their manifesto or enunciate in their speeches or whatever, or actually is most of this basically a ritual that voters don't take a great deal of notice of. Certainly the first most um, influential academic theory in this area, known as party identification theory, which came out of the States in the 1950s, said, well, actually, no, primarily what voters vote on is on the basis of emotion, not necessarily on the basis of cognitive evaluations. They vote on the basis of loyalties. They vote on the idea that I am a Democrat, I am a Republican, I am a Conservative, I am Labour. And insofar as perhaps they do have ideas about what should happen, so far as public policy is concerned, they are derived from those loyalties. Ah, the Conservative Party thinks it's a good idea, therefore I will think it's a good idea. Uh, and that's uh, often uh, been argued. Now, I should say, however, that's not necessarily the way we necessarily conceive of the electorate. Now, not least because the number, the proportion of the electorate that has a strong emotional uh, uh, empathy with a political party, uh, that proportion now seems to be much diminished from what it was uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, though it has to be said, I would still argue from research I've done that uh, Tony Blair in particular, uh, although he thought he was chasing the median voter, he thought he was chasing the centre of British politics, actually what he succeeded in doing because he changed the stance of his party so radically is that actually he shifted the electorate to the right because lots of Labour voters took their cue from Tony Blair and shifted to the right ideologically as well. So you can still see that process uh, going on. But uh, the truth is, insofar as we actually think of voters having something, some content to what they say in the ballot box beyond I'm going to vote either Conservative or Labour or whoever, we tend not to think of it not so much in you know, the detail of policy, but much more about the broad values that parties are associated with. The truth is that you know, if you are somebody who thinks the state should be a wee bit smaller and you think perhaps it should be spending a little bit less, there is a tendency for you to be more likely to vote Conservative than Labour. Conversely, if you take the opposite view, you are inclined to be more likely to be a Labour voter. However, of course, what this means is that the ideas that people have about political parties are certainly not renewed afresh at a particular election, but are often, parties are often associated with ideas over very long periods of time. So that's the reason, for example, I mean, many of you, some of you may be aware that the policy of the last coalition to successively increase the personal uh, allowance for income tax was actually a Liberal Democrat idea. But you try persuading most voters that reducing taxation is not a Conservative idea. It's quite difficult to do, and most people think it was a Conservative idea, and the Conservatives got both claimed and acquired the credit for doing it. But actually, it was a Liberal Democrat manifesto idea. So you can see, therefore, how, however, the long term means, these long term ideas means that when parties come up with ideas of a particular election, voters don't necessarily notice. But of course, we should also be, however, even if you think, mm, well, maybe the state should be a bit smaller, and I would normally vote Conservative. But if you perhaps think that at the moment the Conservative Party is rather badly divided, isn't perhaps terribly likely to be successful in implementing its ideas, then actually what you find is that irrespective of voters' ideological position, they end up being less likely to vote for that party at that point in time. In other words, yes, broad values, broad perceptions of the ideological positions of the parties matter, but so do other things. Perceptions of competence, people's perceptions of the record of the party in office. Because the idea that voters are voting for policy ideas presumes that what voters are doing in the ballot box is thinking prospectively. But actually voters maybe are voting retrospectively. How good a job has the government done? If it's not bad, OK, we'll give them another chance. If it's been pretty useless, you think, hang on, let's try the other lot. And certainly an awful lot of um, uh, electoral research suggests that voters are often evaluating 
parties on the basis of their past record rather than their future promises. After all, arguably, that's a, re a rational thing to do. What's the best guide to future performance, past record, albeit, as every stockbroker will tell you, it's not necessarily a 100% guide. Now, of course, what's also true, however, is that the way in which the, whatever uh, mandate is being given by voters in the ballot box, whatever sending the message they are giving, is also, however, shaped by the electoral system within which they're operating. So it's pretty common here for a party that wins an overall majority to say, and as a result, we have a mandate to do this because this is what voters voted for. Usually ignoring the fact that, of course, in virtually, well, indeed in all post-war British elections, no political party has actually won over 50% of the vote. Um, I well remember the arguments about, for example, what was the message that voters were sending about taxation in 1992, and people said, ah, the Conservatives won, therefore, actually, the voters were telling us they didn't want taxation going up. Actually, rather ignoring the fact that if you added the votes to go to the Liberal Democrats, who were explicitly in favour of increasing taxation, and the Labour Party, who were thought to be in favour of increasing taxation, actually, between them, they had a majority of the votes in that election. So, therefore, there's the, the argument about the mandate and its meaning is also shaped by the electoral system. There's a whole political science literature about whether mandates and the messages of voters are more effectively distributed through one mechanism or the other. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but I will simply say to you there are arguments on both sides of the fence. Let me then briefly move on to mandates in referendums, which at the moment, as it were, apart from whether or not Theresa May should have called another election or not, is uh, the other uh, subject of uh, political argumentation um, in the outside world. Um, now, in a sense, referendums are much easier than um, elections to interpret. First of all, to win a referendum, you do actually need to get 50% plus one of the votes. So whereas with a parliamentary system, usually nobody gets, manages to meet that threshold, whether you're using proportional representation or um, a majoritarian system, with a referendum, the only way you can win is to get a majority of the votes cast by at least those people who turned out to vote. Two, in theory at least, it's about a particular idea. Problem, one of the problems with voters face in, a, in an election is that they're being presented with bundles of proposals, and they might like some of the Conservative proposals, and some of the Labour proposals, and some of the Democrat proposals, and some of the UK proposals, which ones do they go for? With a referendum, there is, at least in theory, one idea. However, there are two potential problems, both of which have been demonstrated with both the 2014 Scottish Independence referendum and the 2016 EU referendum. The first is that implementing the instruction may depend on the cooperation of others. So, for example, the vision of independence that the, the SNP were promoting in September 2014 actually depended on the cooperation of the UK government, for example, over sharing the pound, to be realised. And that was not within the gift of the Scottish government to deliver. Uh, now, equally, of course, Whatever nature of Brexit we get is, isn't simply up to the UK government to determine. It actually also depends on what the EU is willing to offer. So again, to that extent at least, therefore, referendums become more problematic when the proposition that's being put forward isn't something that's entirely within, within the control of the proposer. In contrast, the 2011 referendum on the alternative vote, it was perfectly clear. If we voted yes, we could have the alternative vote. If we voted no, we wouldn't, and there's no, nothing terribly problematic about it. The other area which become, can become problematic, which is particularly obvious for 2016, is that particularly when, and this, it has to be said, 2016 was rather unusual. It's relatively unusual for governments to call referendums and then to tell people, please, to vote against the, the, pro the, the, the proposition for change. Governments usually hold referendums because they want to change something. 2016 was rather unusual because the government didn't want to change something. But that, therefore, created the, the, the position whereby those who were voting in campaigning for leave and who, in the end, won the day, were campaigning for something that they were never necessarily going to be in a position to deliver. 
uh, and that's the arguments at the moment about the accountability of the promises um, that they made. Um, the 2014 independence referendum is quite somewhat different because that was quite unusual because you had two governments on two sides of the argument, both of whom at least had standing to pursue the policy that they were arguing for if they wished to do so. Okay, um, now again with uh, referendums, as you've already uh, pointed out, there are questions about the competence of voters, etc. cetera. Um, um, I won't go into that. Is the idea of a mandate a good idea? Well, perhaps now particularly coming back to the idea of a policy mandate. I would suggest to some degree it is, at least making politicians to write down on a, a few sides of A4 what they think they're going to do for the next few years does at least mean that they have to think a little about what they're going to do before they get caught up in the rush of trying to run government. And voters, I think, can at least in elections and again also in referendums send a broad signal about the direction in which they want things to go. But do, do we think that they look at every I and every T? Definitely not. And politicians who make claims on that assumption are probably pushing the idea much too far. Thank you very much. John. <laughs> well, if, you, if you think the, the EU referendum was odd, just, I can top it with the referendum in Greece in 2015. Yes. The, the government called the referendum, <laughs> called uh, uh, for people to vote no. People do vote no, an overwhelming majority, and then the government does exactly the opposite. Yep. Uh, so there you go, it comes full circle. Shana. Well, thank you very much for the invitation from the LSE here tonight. I'm, I'm afraid I'm actually going to talk mainly about Brexit. I thought that's what my mandate was. Um, and I'm going to talk mainly about legal issues, but there'll be a little bit of political theory and philosophy thrown in. I have three points that I want to make with a preliminary assumption, I think. And I'm going to try and get through those as quickly as possible. So if they seem a bit sketchy and rushed, forgive me, but happy to elaborate in questions if necessary. Um, my preliminary assumption is this, that the British constitutional system rests on a combination of representative democracy and parliamentary sovereignty. And I'm going to undermine that second point a little bit in a minute because I'm going to talk about Scotland, uh, where things may be a little bit different. But generally speaking, <coughs> representative democracy, because we don't, when I, when I teach my students and they answer, I say, well, what's your, what's your evidence? What's your legal source? Or what's your source for this? And when it comes to popular sovereignty or direct democracy, we've, we've heard a lot about that in the context of the referendum, but there really isn't a great deal to back up a statement that we are now moving to a constitutional system in the UK that respects popular sovereignty. Little bits and pieces here and there, maybe the EU Act 2011, use of a referendum in that context. But really, one has to go back to Oliver Cromwell and the Institute of Government to find any specific reference to the sovereignty of the people. So what we have is a, a representative democracy. One can look to Edmund Burke, one can look to J.S. Mill for some evidence in political theory of that. And we also have an emphasis on parliamentary sovereignty. Um, uh, Dicey has been almost done to death on this, but um, parli parliament and the sovereignty of parliament is something that a lot of people have liked to stress. So the role of referendums is rather hazy when it comes to their place in our constitution. So that's my assumption. I then have three points that I want to make. Um, one is, what does the vote to leave the EU in June actually require? What kind of mandate, if any, is that? Secondly, I want to talk a little bit more about the argument from democracy. We've heard a lot about the people speaking about democracy in the context of the EU referendum. And so this is where I want to turn to Scotland and talk a bit about Scotland and devolution and popular sovereignty, which may undermine some of the other things I'm saying. Um, 
and the question of whether there is a separate mandate for Scotland, that the mandate that was given in the UK or England and Wales, let's say, may be different from a Scottish mandate. Thirdly, I want to talk about something else which has bothered me quite a lot, which is how the Britain leaving the EU uh, affects people's rights. Uh, as UK citizens, we are <coughs> EU citizens, and when we leave the EU, we're going to lose a lot of our human rights. So can the referendum provide a mandate? Can it legitimate a loss of rights that are currently enjoyed by people as a result of EU membership? And I would argue that the referendum vote, the result of the referendum vote by itself, can't legitimate. So, starting with actually the, the consequences of this, this referendum vote. Uh, so, point number one. First, first thing I say is that the referendum, this EU referendum, is, is advisory only. It's not mandatory. Legally, government, parliament could ignore it if they choose to. Very often the contrast is drawn with the alternative vote referendum where specific com um, consequences of a yes or a no vote were spelled out. So this was an advisory referendum. It doesn't entail specific legal consequences. However, it's become a truism to say that politically the matter is different. It would be inexpedient for politicians to ignore this um, vote, albeit a slender majority vote, to ignore it. Yet if we look round about, we can see there are plenty of examples in the world where politicians have chosen to do just that. In the context of the EU, there have, of course, been referendums held on whether countries should implement new EU treaties. In the Irish case of the Lisbon Treaty, for example, going back to the Maastricht Treaty, there were referendums on that, and people have voted against um, implementing the treaty, and then they have been persuaded one way or another to change their mind. Uh, if we move completely away from the EU, one example I like is the example of Sweden. Um, the question back in the 50s, what side of the road should you drive on? Uh, should you stay driving on the left, same as Great Britain, uh, which is what people voted to do uh, overwhelmingly. But the Swedish government decided it was in the best interest of the people to move to driving on the right, and a short while later, that's what they did. So politically, the situation might be different. There's also an interesting question here when it comes to mandates of what the status of any government statements prior to the referendum might be. Uh, the, government state, the, 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 the Cameron government stated in its policy paper back in February 2016 that it believed it was under a democratic duty to give effect to the electorate's decision. And I think this was presented to Parliament and not challenged. But what sort of a, uh, a statement is that? A statement made by a government. Um, this might look rather like a, a proclamation, but we've heard talk about there being a direct mandate from the people in the referendum to the government. But in our parliamentary and representative democracy, I don't think that's how the system works. The government can't proclaim that it has that sort of direct mandate from a referendum. So then what is a, a matter uh, of law? What does the vote to leave the EU in the referendum require? Does it require a hard Brexit? I don't think so, actually, um, because when people voted to leave the EU by 51.9%, they voted to leave the EU. Um, they didn't vote to leave the EU in any particular way. Therefore, if the government chose to negotiate for some sort of Norwegian-style option, uh, as far as I can see, there would be nothing legally objectionable about that. It's sometimes said that immigration played, or, or uh, feelings of antagonism towards immigration played a part in the referendum result. But I don't think we have any hard evidence whatsoever that we can get to a majority of those who voted in the referendum that way of favoring a reduction in immigration. Indeed, the polls, um, <laughs> well, I was looking at the Lord Ashcroft poll who suggested that um, immigration was, was not a key, <coughs> or, or that there were a sufficiently small percentage of people, but enough to take you over 50%, for whom immigration would not have been the key reason. 
Um, so I think it's interesting then to speculate on what a vote, a, a vote to leave the EU leads to. Does it lead to any particular type of Brexit? So that's point number one. Point number two, I move from the UK overall to Scotland. And I'm, I'm sorry that I'm only talking about Scotland and not about Northern Ireland, where there has been a very interesting legal case and where perhaps the issues of Brexit are the most pressing of all. But I'll talk about Scotland because I know a little bit more about that. And here I'm switching over because I'm coming back to this argument about democracy, the argument that we hear many, many times, that democracy requires that this, this vote um, of the 51.9% is respected, that this is a popular vote. And as I tried to suggest earlier, we don't have any great tradition of popular sovereignty in the UK constitutional system. But one area where at least political theory suggests that there is a tradition of popular sovereignty has been in Scotland. And the Scottish government has been quite willing to take up the argument um, that each part, each nation of the UK's vote should be respected. And if we look at this, the UK consists of England and Wales, Scotland, Ireland, uh, Gibraltar. Um, if you count Gibraltar, three out of five territories voted to remain in the EU. Um, and um, so the argument against that is, well, aren't we a, a unitary state? Isn't it important that the UK acts all together as a whole? Well, I think that's not, strictly speaking, accurate. The UK is not actually, strictly speaking, a unitary state, but a union state. And the question is how we understand that union legally and politically. We have devolution. We're a multinational state. And as far as some Scots would argue, um, the union has been entered into voluntarily. Uh, negotiated on its own terms of entry. Neil McCormick, a great Scottish lawyer and legal theorist, said that it's at least possible that although we have a single state, we have two interpretations, two conceptions, two understandings of the constitution of that state. And in Scotland, we can look to various traditions, um, going to look to theorists such as George Buchanan, to a tradition of popular sovereignty. So the question I would pose is this, if, if we are saying that um, democracy requires us to respect the will of the people in terms of popular sovereignty, what do we then do when the UK overall doesn't seem to respect such a tradition, but various parts of it might? Where does that leave us? Does that mean that we should look at various um, sub-state traditions of constitutional law in Scotland or in Northern Ireland or in Wales. <coughs> I mean, there are various statements coming from the highest Scottish courts suggesting that parliamentary sovereignty as a doctrine doesn't have this great tra tradition and veneration that it has through Dicey in England. So that's point number two. And Point number three, I come to the point of human rights. Uh, so a point that applies to all of us, um, one way or another, certainly all of us who are UK nationals, because the question is this, at root, can the referendum legitimate a diminution of our rights and liberties, which we currently enjoy as a result of our membership of the EU? Um, because there is a, a democratic issue here, a democratic challenge when it comes to the question of losing our rights. Many people in the Leave campaign said people would have more sovereignty, take back control, whatever that means. Um, but it appears as a result of doing this, we're going to have fewer rights, um, which certainly could result in less individual sovereignty for each one of us. What do I mean when I say people will have fewer rights? Well, through the European Communities Act, which implements, which enforces EU law in the UK, um, we benefit from rights that we derive from EU law. Some of these rights cannot be replaced by any national legislation, such as the Great Repeal Bill, 
um, which is apparently going to be instigated by the government next year. If you take, for example, the right to vote in the European Parliament, well, that will go altogether when Britain leaves the EU, for obvious reasons. Rights to freedom of movement are very, very likely to go. It's likely that um, there will be requirements maybe for visas, but it will be more difficult to move from state to state. Other rights, such as the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, um, the loss of them is up for grabs, um, but it's a bit questionable. And what is certainly, I think, risky is that their um, implementation into national law removes any sort of entrenchment or semi-entrenchment that having an apex court in the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, might have provided. <coughs> Things like workers' rights, the working time regulations, um, workers' rights, which are currently um, protected in, e in UK secondary law only. So there are all sorts of issues of um, loss of rights that I think is very important. And this relates to the lawsuit um, which was ongoing a couple of weeks ago in the High Court and the argument that the prerogative, um, the government, the executive's power to go to Brussels and tell the European Council that Britain is formally withdrawing from the EU, um, that that cannot be done without the consent or maybe even parliamentary legislation insofar as it would render the European Communities Act a dead letter and thus result in this inevitable loss of rights. So that brings me back finally to this mandate question. Um, really, um, was this, is this the mandate that has been given to the government to remove all of these rights? And with it, incidentally, EU citizenship. I find it quite bothersome that there has been so little discussion of what it means for UK nationals to lose their EU citizenship, not just expats, not just um, EU citizens from other member states living over here, but the 60-odd you know, UK nationals. I, I, is there a mandate? And if so, what sort of mandate would that be, to have that citizenship removed? from all of us. So I think this is, a, this is a bothersome issue. So these are, are three troubling issues. And, and what I would conclude in all of this is that they tell us that we are rather confused about the main principles of the British Constitution. Brexit, we think, is about Britain's relationship with the EU. But in trying to leave the EU, we find out that there are these huge, huge questions which are raised and we don't have very clear answers. We don't have very clear answers about what the meaning, what the interpretation of a referendum should be in our national law, um, whether it involves some embrace of popular sovereignty. We don't have a clear idea of what the picture of the devolved nations is. Can they in some way block Brexit? Uh, could Scotland try to block Brexit? Legally, they don't seem to have a chance. But in political terms, if there is an argument in terms of political um, sovereignty, maybe <coughs> that is a stronger argument. And thirdly, how can it be that so many rights um, could seemingly be taken away, perhaps by executive power? Uh, these to me are all immense questions, and I'm not clear that there is a very strong mandate for any of these. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me here this evening. This is rather a rich seam. It's so rich that we're probably in danger of disappearing off in 101 different directions and losing our focus. So I think that what I propose to do this evening in trying to respond to some of the things that have been said, but also give you perhaps a politician's take, I should add a conservative politician's take, I think that's quite important, is simply try to divide my points into three as others have done. First one is, what do I think the United Kingdom's constitution is? And in that sense, what role is there in it for popular sovereignty? Second one, what do referendums do to this? And in particular, what has the Brexit referendum 
done to this theory. And thirdly, a look at perhaps the consequences, the rather odd consequences that flow from it. Now, I'm an old-fashioned, Dicean conservative. I happen to believe that the best identification one can make of the Constitution of the United Kingdom is that sovereignty rests in a strange mixture between the crown in the person of the sovereign and the people, but as expressed through representative parliamentary democracy. So by that, there is an acknowledgement that the uh, crown uh, is, in a sense, has a degree of ownership of the nation, but at the same time, under certainly the English system that we have, as you're probably aware, even in our coronation ceremony, the crown has to be the subject of popular approval and acclamation. It used to be done by the boys, always done by the boys of my old school, um, who are, represent the people in acclaiming the, the, the monarch during the coronation ceremony, and it's regarded as being an essential part of it. But thereafter, power lies between the crown, and nowadays the crown through the crown's ministers, and parliament. And the principle that it is representative democracy where the sovereignty lies in parliament is really very well established. It follows from that that when one considers the role of Pub, uh, 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 of a popular mandate or um, the sovereignty of the people, actually, within the UK constitutional setup, I think it's very doubtful that there is a direct popular will or sovereignty that can be exercised. It's moderated through the representative democracy. And parliamentarians can be removed at five yearly intervals fundamental part of our constitutional system but whilst they are there at Westminster they are subject to their desire to be re-elected free to do largely whatever they want although there is lurking in the background of our system in the United Kingdom derived from English notions of sovereignty the suggestion which I think is becoming more and more well established that actually there are limits over what parliamentary sovereignty in practice can do. There was a big debate over this in the 17th century. Uh, there was an even bigger debate that goes right back into the Middle Ages. Uh, it goes back to Magna Carta as to what the limits of proper governance might be. It goes back, you can see it in the words of Sir John Fortescue in the 15th century when he said uniquely amongst any country in Europe the King of England could not rule by decree. And it re-established itself in the 17th century in the dispute between Parliament and the Crown as to where sovereignty lay. And before that came to final fruition, there were comments like from um, Chief Justice Cook that actually the, uh, even the Parliament, the King in Parliament, the legislature, was subject to reason and the common law, and in certain circumstances, the courts could overrule it. But the glorious revolution of 1688 put Parliament firmly in the driving seat and raised the interesting question that if Parliament wished to behave tyrannically, was there any force that could stop it? That is a subject which is currently very much live when it comes to the relationship between the judiciary and our court system and Parliament. Mm -hmm. And there are, from time to time, some quite interesting cases cropping up. A recent one involving uh, myself in an indirect way, Evans and the Attorney General, uh, which highlighted the judges completely ignoring a statute that had been enacted by Parliament because they thought it offended basic principles of the rule of law. Uh, and, of course, uh, we've, got, we've got it again, or may have it again, I'll come back to this in a moment, in the question of uh, the referendum. But that, I think, is what our democracy is about in this country. Now, I picked up Shona's comments about Scotland being different from England. And it may be that Scotland could be a bit different from England in that respect. But I've always just been a tiny bit wary of drawing this distinction that somehow the foundations of Scottish nationhood 
lie in a different sort of identity from our own, partly because, as I say, our queen still has to be acclaimed by the boys of my old school in order to the coronation to be valid, uh, but secondly, because ultimately I think that there may be a degree of myth in all this. It is true that there are references, we talk of Mary, Queen of Scots, rather than Mary, Queen of Scotland, and there seems sometimes to be a distinction which people try to make between the King of England or the Queen of Scots, or in France it was done in the 19th century when Louis-Philippe became King of the French rather than King of France, implying a degree of popular approval uh, for his being there. But I must say, I think it's become pretty intermingled in the last 300 years, and I have a doubt in my mind that Scotland is really uh, very different from England in that respect. That then brings me on to point two, which is about referendums. Referendums are, to my mind, plainly merely advisory methods in our Constitution by which Parliament, if it is so minded, goes to get the opinion of the public or allows the public to express an opinion because what you get is the opinion of the voting public, not the opinion of the public generally. It's those who choose to exercise, in the case of our current referendum on Brexit, 72% of the electorate who decided it was worth their while to express a view. Referendums, however, are plainly important because they are an expression of the political will of the people. And I think, on the whole, in a dem democracy, for parliamentarians to ignore the political will expressed by a majority of the ele electorate is rather a dangerous thing to do. To take an example, suppose the Scottish referendum had gone the other way, it would have been merely advisory. But would it have been sensible then for the Westminster Parliament to turn round and say uh, to the Scottish electorate, thank you very much for telling us you want to be independent and separate from us, but I'm afraid we're going to do nothing about it. It is, I think, if you attempt to subvert expressions of political will of this kind, an invitation for the democratic legitimacy and structures of your state to be ignored by the people who themselves have been ignored in the referendum. So I think it's a dangerous course of action to take. But it is ultimately advisory. And the interesting thing is that when Parliament has wanted a referendum to be more than advisory, then as in the case of the alternative vote referendum, Parliament provided a mechanism by which the referendum immediately triggered an executive act of putting the alternative vote system laws into operation. That was certainly not the case with the referendum on the EU, and for the very good reason that's been touched on by everybody else on this panel, that of course effectively it was an asking the electorate for an expression of their will, but a will that could not be translated immediately into a reality. In fact, far from it. Far from it being easy to translate the public will into reality, Parliament and the government are now faced with the complete conundrum <laughs> of how on earth they're supposed to translate the express wish of the public into something which is viable, granted that government and parliament also have a duty, rather well established in our democratic system, that their principal things that they have to pay attention to are the security and the defence of the realm, the security of the person and property of its citizens, their economic well-being and their quality of life. And those criteria which lie absolutely at the root of what parliament and government are supposed to do are unfortunately at variance with what the public are asking for, which is the embarking on a high-risk strategy. And that's why we are currently mired in an impasse of which nobody quite knows how to get out of it. To put it another way, the public in the referendum expressed a desire for a revolutionary act to take place, entirely contrary to 50 years of settled government policy of both political parties that have been in power in that period, including actually the third party when there was the coalition. Carrying out revolutions requires breaking eggs, 
and requires revolutionaries who are prepared to be fixed on the particular objective at the cost of throwing away anything else. That's a rather a tall order to ask of a United Kingdom government based on the principles of parliamentary sovereignty and representative democracy, which naturally tends to be rather cautious. So that's why we are now where we are. And the consequences are, can be manifested and are seen, firstly, in the fact that those politicians who supported Brexit are now arguing very hard that Brexit is confined to a narrow set of mandate that the government must pursue. That mandate, in fact, doesn't exist in that form. It's perfectly clear that the question that was asked was a very broad question. Do you want to be in the EU or not? So it can be interpreted in a wide variety of different ways, and that is going to be played out in Parliament. Secondly, and I think this is the second thing which comes out, is that although the government has shown some tendency to say that the government has a mandate directly from the people to carry out Brexit, if the penny hasn't dropped already, it is going to drop very clearly over the next six months that governments in our system of representative democracy cannot survive without parliamentary support. <laughs> and therefore, the idea that the government can do this on the basis of a popular mandate is impossible. It's got to take parliament with it. Now, I don't want to talk about the case which is currently before our divisional court in England. I think, actually, the applicants may win it, but they may lose it. It's very difficult to know. It's a matter of law and goes right back to those 17th century foundations of our state about the extent to which a government can ignore parliament when doing an act which undermines statutory rights conferred by parliament. I don't quite know how that will play out. But even if the government wins that case, it seems to me that logically it cannot carry this project out without parliamentary support. And in my view, the government should actually seek parliamentary support to trigger Article 50, because even if they don't, they're going to need parliamentary support for everything else that they do, or they will disappear down the plug hole. So we are facing very uncertain times. Of course, traditionally in this country, what happens if a government loses parliamentary support is that you have a general election, and that could happen. But, of course, the irony is that even if you were to have a general election, it's by no means certain that that would then put in a government which is any better able to implement the public will as expressed in the referendum than the situation today. So to try to conclude and pull these strands together, I would say that referendums are legitimate tools for testing public opinion, but they're quite dangerous tools when that opinion then needs to be translated into a reality when the reality is uncertain and dependent on a whole series of external factors, including, for example, the continental partners within the EU from whom we now wish to separate ourselves. <coughs> and unfortunately the referendum itself was conducted in a fashion on both sides which didn't enable a proper debate to take place we're probably getting that proper debate now but arguably it's a little bit late so I hope I've probably tried to touch on a range of topics there are no easy answers to this question uh, but I think that fundamentally the United Kingdom's concept of popular sovereignty does lie exclusively and in practice and short of a revolution through representative democracy. And there is no other way at present for that to be expressed in practice in order to deliver change. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we don't have uh, that much time for questions, uh, but uh, we do have some time. Uh, so a, a few of you will have to speak for the whole, I suppose, or those of you who do have the chance for, uh, uh, okay, this gentleman here first. Thank you to the um, panel for the um, talk tonight. Um, might I ask, um, I think a lot of you have uh, touched on this already, but what is the interaction between uh, the turnout that we have in referenda and in elections? 
uh, with a mandate. Okay. Uh, would you like to address this question to uh, uh, one of the speakers in particular, or just any of To anyone in the panel. I mean, all of you have Thank touched, you. I think, in one way or another on uh, it. Okay. Uh, Stefan, uh, if we could ask you to identify yourselves as well, just tell us your name. So hello, my name is Stefano Battiato. I'm from uh, Italy and I studied law at the LSE. So my question is also regarding referendums in general. So in the Brexit referendum, 28 of the electorate didn't express an opinion. And in Italy, we're having an upcoming referendum in uh, not very long. And poll suggests that anywhere from 20 to 40% of the people will not vote. So my question is when the people don't speak, what does it mean and uh, how should we react? <laughs> Do we have a third question to group with the first two? Okay, the gentleman, uh, actually the gentleman here, the, the blue tie, please. So, uh, my question's uh, a little bit abstract, but it's, uh, it sort of works for an analogy. So in the context of medical law, or healthcare law, for example, um, there's a question about when you ask a patient to make a decision, whether what they actually give you is a decision. You need to establish first whether they have capacity to make that, and if that turns on whether they can, amongst other things, understand and weigh up the information given to them. Now, something that everyone's addressed here is that the quality of debate's been very poor, and we can all agree that the EU is a very complicated topic. Do you think it's possible for us to say that the people have actually spoken, given the quality of that debate? Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, Catherine, would you like to take any of them? Yeah. Well, I can maybe say a little bit about the last two. I mean, because in, in some sense, uh, if I hear them correctly, they, they overlap uh, at least in some way, because I think you're asking when they don't speak, and if I could, if I, what, what, what are we to take from that? And I think if I understood you correctly, you're saying that given that the, given that the um, quality of the debate has been poor, can we take what they have said as being anything at all, as it were? Precisely. Yes. And um, um, I mean, uh, that is, uh, I can't answer that question because that is, in a sense, my question. Um, uh, I think a referendum does, or, or any political decision, uh, when one asks people, um, you know, to express their will on anything, it, it, it assumes that people are in a situation, in a condition where they can make a decision, and that assumes that they have the relevant information. And I think in this case, as so often though, um, it is arguably not the case that, that, uh, that they had the relevant information, um, uh, or even could have had it, given the complexity of the matter. So I, I, I might be inclined to say that, at least in one sense, they didn't speak because the preconditions for them making a decision seem to me not really to have been in place. Um, but I think there is another sense in which, and that's what I, why I distinguish between the substantive issue and the procedural issue, there is another sense in which one might say they did speak, uh, just simply in the sense of uh, saying no rather than yes. Uh, and one might say um, that if if what was wanted was a decision, however arbitrarily taken, then in that sense maybe a decision was taken. And perhaps that contrasts with, with, with what you're saying, is that you might be saying, well, at least the British took a decision, maybe arbitrarily so, um, but at least they turned up, 70% um, uh, of them turned up and voiced their uninformed or more or less uninformed position on something. Whereas when people don't even turn up, what is one to make of that? I think, I, I mean, so my, my intuitive response to, to what you're saying is that, is thinking, um, well, that's kind of worse. <laughs> because that suggests a complete disengagement from, from the political process. And so we seem to then be in this, in this, in this rather odd situation where we're almost saying, well, an arbitrary decision is perhaps better than none at all. Um, but <laughs> I, I don't know whether, but I really want to say that. <laughs> um, okay, can I make three quick points? The first is, I think we should remember that this was a second referendum. 
the introduction of the notion of, of popular sovereignty into the UK constitution can be dated to the 1975 referendum on EU membership. And given that at that point, Parliament in effect decided that whether or not we should be a member of the European Union was something that should be decided by the people. I presume, therefore, we have to accept that they, the, the, the people retained the right to, to, to change its mind in 2016. The second thing I would say about turnout is this. The turnout in the Scottish independence referendum was 85%. That is the highest level of turnout in any ballot north of the border since the advent of the mass franchise in 1918. The turnout in the European Union referendum at 71% was higher than in any parliamentary general election since 1997. If you don't think the turnouts in those referendum, in, in those ballots are good enough, I don't know why you think that Dominic should be allowed to espouse uh, parliamentary sovereignty because the foundations in terms of democratic expression and will of the electorate on which Parliament currently rests are thinner than either of those two referendums. Thank you. Uh, John, would you like to... Yeah. Um, well, just firstly on the um, interaction between turnout and mandates, um, I mean, there are mechanisms that are used in, in some <coughs> referendums for threshold requirements, and we've already heard about uh, the size of the vote from, from John Curtis, but... Um, sometimes there's a requirement for a supermajority in, in referendums too. And the 1979 devolution referendums provide, I think, quite an interesting example um, where a majority of people in Scotland did vote in favour of devolution, but not the required percentage of the electorate as a whole. And although there was a very, very high um, turnout in the EU referendum, I suppose we might say, on the other hand, it was a very, very slim percentage of a majority and we might ask whether in some cases uh, should it be possible to bring about such a fundamental change on such a slim majority um, for example now we have a fixed term parliaments act it's quite difficult to have a general election I mean a two-thirds uh, majority of all sitting um, MPs is required and, and so this, uh, I'm not, not saying this just in the context of the EU referendum, but in the context of independence as well. Um, there's also a question of, um, in the case of, of major constitutional change, should there be extra requirements? And this is something that some written constitutions do. Uh, moving on to the second qu uh, example of relating to the medical example, can people weigh up the evidence? Um, can we say people have actually spoken? Uh, can they give some sort of informed consent? Well, I suppose that sometimes the issues for a referendum might be seen as being so complex that there could be a question mark over that. And that's the difference to a parliamentary election where you are electing somebody to represent you. And that, that is the difference between a referendum and uh, representative democracy. And one can just read Burke and, and read Mill to see why they recommend representative democracy rather than some sort of popular sovereignty of the people speaking. I mean, J.S. Mill is a very interesting example of somebody who believed in democracy, but he also has these little elitist tendencies that slip in that he doesn't quite really trust people. They need a little bit of aristocratic, or not aristocratic, but elitist guidance. So if that is a worry, then you should not hold referendums. And of course, we can all find bad examples. For example, Switzerland is quite a nice one. In 1959, a referendum was hold on wh held on whether women should get the vote, and only men could vote, and they decided not to give it to women. So <laughs> you can get these bad results. So, so if that's a worry, then we shouldn't be having referendums. Thank you, Sean. Well, first of all, I agree with John Curtis that um, the people did speak in the referendum on the 23rd of June. It, they, pl they plainly did. Um, I agree with him about the turnout. Uh, it was very high. And uh, we give people an opportunity to elect parliaments, and they turn out in fewer numbers. Uh, but it's still a legitimate expression of their views. And I also agree with this comment that the referendum was a second referendum. And there's an interesting issue as to why we held the first. I mean, <laughs> you could argue for that reasons. the first <laughs> referendum was held for reasons of internal Labour Party politics. 
But actually, you can also argue, and some people did at the time, because I remember it, that it was right to hold a referendum because what was being done by the UK government and parliament or had been done in joining the EU was such a fundamental pooling of sovereignty that went outside the norms of governmental behaviour that it was something where you had to get an express popular mandate to do it. And interestingly, you can also argue that one of the drivers behind the referendum vote this year in overturning that was the rejection of the very elements which had been signed up to in 1975. I know some people say, oh, well, the, it was the EEC in 75, and now it's something radically different. Actually, I don't subscribe to that. The, the real kernel of this was that in 75, we signed up to an international organization which required us to accept the direct effect of its law through its courts into our own system, what Lord Denning spoke about as the incoming tide. And arguably, what was rejected in June of this year was that incoming tide. We want to get back control. So oddly enough, although I don't think the electorate ever had a rational debate around them about the implications and complexities of what was required in unraveling the relationship, actually, I have to say to you, I think they got the basic issue perfectly reasonably right. It's just that I happen to think, personally as a Remainer, that they came up with the wrong answer, partly because the political class failed them so badly in articulating and explaining what the real issues were about and diverting them down roads, some of which were fanciful, on both sides. Is there something that we could do about this for the future? Well, I mean, you can argue that if you're going to overturn the status quo in a referendum, you should have thresholds. That's what we did in 1979 with the first referendum on Scottish devolution. Uh, and people ultimately didn't much care for it because there was a majority vote for a Scottish parliament in 1979. But on the other hand, uh, it was not sufficient to bring about the change. So that's why we didn't do it in that way. But it's true to say that the more fundamental the change that takes place the more you should put in the caveats. And that brings me finally to the status of referendums. What I will not accept is the argument that I get from some Brexit colleagues, the people have spoken forevermore. No, they haven't. <laughs> the people have spoken. What we had was a snapshot of the expressed opinion of the electorate on the 23rd of June, 2016. I haven't the slightest idea what their expressed opinion might be today, and even less what it's going to be in 12 months or 24 months' time. Now, obviously, sensible governments have to have certainty and continuity. You can't spend your time zipping around all over the place. That's why we have five-year parliaments, and not annual parliaments, as was once called for in a, by some of the people in our arguing for constitutional change. Um, but that said, it's perfectly possible that people may change their mind. And then Parliament's going to have to think about that, which is why I just don't subscribe to this. Otherwise, what you're doing is using referendums as an instrument of tyranny. And there is plenty of experience of how that has been manipulated throughout the ages. Thank you. Well, you beat me to it. I was going to invite you to join me in thanking our, our speakers for an incredibly uh, uh, rich uh, discussion, which uh, seems to me uh, boils down to, to the fact that the, the Brexit referendum was not just about the relationship of the UK with the European Union, but also about the relationship of the British state with its own people and how it is constitutionally uh, framed. So thank you all very much, and thank you again to all our speakers.